And then set up my video. Hopefully it's all going live now. So is anyone out there? Good evening. Ah, we're live. So welcome everybody. It's always great to know we're live and everything's working. Thanks everyone for joining us. If you want to post comments, anyone on the viewer tonight, it'd be great for us just so we can see that you're here. It's always, you feel like you're talking to a bit of a vacuum until someone talks to you. Uh, look, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here, if you are. Um, tonight's event is Exposing the Canberra Cull. And it's another horrific testimony of it, and we're really letting people know about the way kangaroos are treated across Australia. My name is Kate Clare and I'm a co-founder of Kangaroos Alive and a co-director of Kangaroo, A Love-Hate Story. I'll be moderating this evening. Firstly, we'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the past, present and future traditional custodians and elders of this country. Thank you so much all for joining us from Australia and overseas tonight. We got, tonight we're going to give kangaroos a voice and I'm looking forward to an informative discussion with our guest speakers. Please be active in your questions and comments and I'll, I'll try to include them along the way. In Australia, kangaroos are driven out, fenced out or shot across the entirety of their native habitat, namely the 4.5 square million square kilometers that have been purloined mainly for animal agriculture. So over the last seven years researching kangaroos for our award-winning movie Kangaroo A Love Hate Story, I found the inhumane treatment of kangaroos in Canberra shocking, counterintuitive and violent. Canberra is Australia's capital for people overseas and it's located in the Australian Capital Territory which we call the ACT and that's governed by the ACT government. This government actively promote that one of the benefits of living in Canberra is its natural environment and the associated native wildlife. Canberra has often been called the bush capital because it's so many urban reserves. It also qualifies as the kangaroo capital compared to any other city. This is still what the Australian Capital Territory government says. And they create a sustainable bush capital means being aware of and understanding how to live alongside our local wildlife. Boy, that sounds great, doesn't it? Living in Canberra. But although Canberra is built on kangaroo habitat, until quite recently, kangaroos graced the streets and parks of Canberra. And Australia's national parliament was so unique and world renowned for having the famous icon on the capital lawns. So that's something to celebrate, right? Well, apparently not, because in 2004, the shooting of kangaroos began when about 800 kangaroos were shot in the reserve adjacent to the Gugong Dam. This was the ACT government's first direct foray into the world of mass killing of Australian wild kangaroos. Since then, many thousands of kangaroos have been shot and bashed to death under their jurisdiction. Why, you may ask, not even the bush capital is a place that kangaroos can call home. Tonight, we have the great opportunity of hearing from some of the women leading the fight for kangaroos in Canberra. They've devoted large parts of their lives to researching, exposing and fighting for the rights of our unique wildlife. We'll be discussing the ACT laws, the science, the media response, urban development, coexistence, the shooters, the police and much, much more. So begin, we're, here, we're going to begin tonight by hearing an eyewitness account of what goes on in Canberra at night so you can all get the picture of what this is so and what culling actually looks like. So first up, let's meet Carolyn Drew. Carolyn's got a Master of Education and Teachers at the University of Canberra. For many years, she has campaigned to protect the kangaroo from ever-increasing threat, ever threats to its existence in Australia. Carolyn is a, pro, a prominent committee member of the Animal Liberation in the ACT for many years and is the Director of Regions for the Institute of Criminal Animal Studies. So we'd like to welcome Carolyn and um, enjoy, I hope you, well, uh, learn something from her talk tonight. Okay, I'll just put her on so we can all see. Solo layout. Welcome, Carolyn. 
Um, welcome. Uh, sorry, are there echoes? No. I think we're It's right. okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, bear with me, folks, because we're uh, fiddling around here on one screen instead of multiple screens, which always means that things don't go well. Um, uh, anyway, Canberra is surrounded by mountain ranges, forests and pasture land. Uh, and there are 39 reserves. Uh, and Karen, Karen, sorry, Caroline, can I just interrupt you? Did you want your slides yet or are you going to, because um, uh, it's on a black screen, I can put them up oh. or? Yeah, just pop, uh, pop them up, that's fine. Okay, cool, let's do that. There, uh, there's no, there's, it's a black screen at the moment for your slides. There you go. Okay, here we are. Uh, and in, uh, of the 39 nature reserves, anywhere between 9 and 15 are shot on or targeted each year by the government. And although the government announces which reserves will be closed for shooting, they make a public announcement, Animal Defenders and the Direct Action Crew never know which ones they'll shoot on from night to night. And although the reserves often appear small uh, to people, they're actually quite huge when you walk through them and they're very hilly. Canberra is a very hilly place. Um, certain reserves are repeatedly shot every year, which is pretty damning. Um, and... <sighs> This is how it starts. This is usually the first salvo, as you can see with this picture. Conservation head, that's the head of the conservation, um, head of uh, environment, says nobody likes it, but the real rue cull is needed. So under the cover of darkness, direct action animal defenders enter reserves on foot, quietly and swiftly, looking for shooters and rangers. Suspicious activity has been reported by those sitting in cars out the front watching the reserves. So we have a group of people who um, park outside the entrances and the reserves have multiple entrances. So I'm just checking, my, putting my time on. The reserves will have multiple entrances. So we have people uh, watching these and then they will give us intelligence as to who's um, gone through an entrance, if they've heard anything. And the direct action animal defenders will then move on to reserve if, if, if it's needed. Uh, earlier though, in the evening, government shooting teams, including park ranger guards would have entered the reserve and set themselves up in hideouts in the tree lines with views of the area to keep watch for the defenders that might come on. The team used night vision equipment. The shooter uses night vision equipment. So there are no spotlights. There are no lights because they don't want, if they use spotlights on the smaller reserves particularly, I'll just go through these pictures as I talk. If they use spotlights um, on the reserves, smaller reserves, we'd see them. So they know that we'd be able to find them easily. Um, but also the people who live in the suburbs are very close to some of these reserves, cheek by jowl in many instances. Um, they'll notice the spotlights as well. So in the smaller reserves, they'll also use silences to try and reduce the sound of the shooting so that uh, the people who live near the reserve and the uh, animal defenders won't actually hear what's going on. Um, entrance gates are festooned, as we can see, with warnings about um, the... Um, shooting that's about to occur. Um, I've also included this picture because it, that's the other thing they do is they, they kill kangaroos, but they also graze cattle on those same reserves. Um, of course, long before the cull, any of these culls have started or killings have started, the rangers have, I call it groomed the kangaroos. And they do this all year round. What they do is they deliberately drive onto the reserve. Sometimes they have to go on to fix up fencing or whatever. But a lot of the time they're just going on so that the kangaroos become used to the sound of their trucks, used to the sound of their voices. And so when the killing season starts and they drive onto the reserves, the kangaroos aren't um, perturbed or scared. So they don't move away. They don't jump away in fear. So they're literally groomed before the cull starts. 
I'll just go into the next slide. So there's a close up there. As you can see, there's certain times that people are allowed on, whether it's the general public or anybody else. And the fines are quite huge. If you get caught on, um, there's a $1,500 fine and an $8,000 fine as well if you end up going to court. Um, the shooters, as I said before, use night vision enabled weapons to target and shoot the kangaroos. Um, on reserves that are larger and further away, like this one here, it's called Mulligan's Flat Sanctuary or Mulligan Sanctuary as we know it. This is a high, high security sanctuary and here they don't use silencers, they use spotlights because you can't actually infiltrate this reserve. There is, by the time you manage to get through any of this fence, if you tried to, it would just be too late and the shooting would be over and done with. Um, stealth is needed so defenders aren't discovered. If court fines are huge, there's co possible court costs and careers are on the line if the, a criminal record's established. On one reserve, they shoot close to a fence line near a busy road. Uh, they do that on both um, uh, some, in some of the southern parks and some of the northern reserves as well. Here shooters are easy, it's easy to access the shooters and the rangers in these smaller parks but ranger and police activity are high. Rangers are positioned so that they can watch all the defenders. They will, um, I know from experience and other activists know from experience that we're being watched constantly. So surveillance levels are very high. Um, on the other hand, on the small, on the reserves, um, on the smaller reserves, uh, closer to the suburbs particularly, they will use silences. And you can actually infiltrate those without too much trouble. High powered beams, if they do find you, out come the high powered beams that they didn't have on at the time. Um, and they uh, search on foot, on quad bikes, on their trucks. Um, even if defenders are only standing near a reserve fence on the outside of the fence, not inside the reserve itself, but close to the shooting, police are often called. One defender, which this um, photo alludes to, was arrested for blowing his whistle. He was blowing his whistle because he was bearing witness to the shooting at one of the reserves and he was also trying to warn the rangers about what he thought was an injured kangaroo that he could hear calling out. Uh, the police came, he was arrested, and then he ended up spending the next, basically the next year going to court. He faced a jail sentence just for blowing a whistle. Yet other defenders, I'll just change my slide, yet other defenders crawl through the reserves on their hands and knees. They try and find rocky crevices, deep ditches, anything that they can hide in while the shooting is going on around them. Um, they're trying their hardest not to get caught and yet at the same time trying to locate where the shooters are positioned. Um, yet others uh, will search in the middle of the night for burial pits. This is a day shot of a burial pit and um, I don't know, the it doesn't seem to be very deep but that's because there's already bodies under, buried in there. Um, some, some animal defenders actually found a burial pit at night and dug it up. Uh, because they were trying to find evidence for body shots, uh, jaw shots, neck shots, because uh, the um, headshot isn't always completed. And animal defenders can attest to that because you can hear it as well. Uh, one night, um, my own experience was one, a, the, a memorable one. One night around midnight, I found myself surrounded by police. Earlier on, I'd had a confrontation with a ranger who'd been following me everywhere because surveillance was high that year. Um, at one point, I uh, slammed on my brakes, I jumped out of my car and I just wrapped my hands, I hammered my hands on his window and asked him if he didn't have anything better to do. I yelled at him and I ended up saying some very unpretty words as well. Um, I was frustrated by his presence because I knew that the shooters had moved very close to where we'd been sitting for uh, a good couple of weeks and we hadn't heard any shooting down the other end of the reserve but because of the high level of surveillance activity we assumed that they were going to shoot very close to where we were sitting and that's exactly what had happened. 
I had sat with these kangaroo families night after night watching the young ones learn how to get through fences. I didn't know until I observed kangaroos because I've only ever observed kangaroos in the wild. I didn't know that um, the mothers would come back and reach, uh, go through a fence and then show their baby how to go through the fence. And they'd call out to their mums because they couldn't get through and then finally they were able to do so. I'd watch them play in the semi-darkness, moving through the reserve. So I got to know them really well. Um, I looked um, in my Carolyn, you just got oh, just got another minute and then we'll get some questions if that's okay. Yeah, okay. Um, surveillance, yeah, as I said, surveillance is quite high. Defenders are often harassed by the police. In years past, the police would come out and shut the shooting down, but then the government, obviously tired of the delays, stopped the police coming out to shut it down, and now they just har um, harass us instead. Uh, the police... That night that I was harassed by the rangers for trying to stop the shooting, the police said I had two choices, either shut up and go home or be arrested. So I chose to stay and, and be quiet rather than being arrested. The purpose of all of this is to slow down and delay the shooting. And that's what we plan to do because the more we can um, harry the rangers, make the shooters very nervous because they know we're there, they know we're watching, they know we're going on trying to find them, the more they're, tr they're going to slow down. And that's the whole purpose of direct action in the coal in Canberra. Um, thanks so much, Carolyn. I, when I first heard your story about just being out there in the night, it's so you're so brave and thank you so much for that work that you're doing. It's it's tough at night and it's cold in Canberra and there's guns. It's not sort of your average night. Um, there's been a few questions about when you talked about the Mulligan's Flat Sanctuary. Why do they call it even a sanctuary if they're killing kangaroos there? That's it, it, It's always been called Mulligan's Flat um, and it never used to have that horrific $4 million security fence around it. It is where they're trying to re- um, help endangered species revive and right. it, it, it isn't a sanctuary particularly for the kangaroos and they're the only animals in that sanctuary that pop it every year within those big fences that um, viewers saw before there are also miles and miles of exclusion fences so it's a bit like a, a puzzle um, a Russian puzzle, there's boxes within boxes within boxes, in other words, paddocks within paddocks within paddocks, and the kangaroos can't move freely, and that's quite uh, that's done quite deliberately. So when they go to shoot them at Mulligan's Flat, it's very much like um, a sideshow where they've just got the targets there and they just mow them down with the guns. It's very easy for them to shoot them because the kangaroos can't escape. Uh, yeah, that uh, it looked like a jail with all that, that razor wiring and everything. And uh, yeah. Tommy, Carolyn, when you're out there at night um, and there's other people around, it must uh, it feel quite dangerous and like you're trying to protect our national icon. It's such an unusual idea that you'd be protecting it, but you're the one that's going to be taken to jail. What, how does that feel for you when you're out there? Um. It's a, it's a strange thing because you spend a lot of time where absolutely nothing happens and you're just sitting around or standing around and then all of a sudden you have to leap into action uh, so that, because you don't know when that action is going to start. So because of that, it, personally, I, I don't feel I'm putting myself at risk um, I don't like the idea of getting arrested again. So last year I tried to stay off the reserves but still nearly got arrested anyway. Mm. Um, and also, too, in, in uh, getting um, nabbed by the rangers when you're out, it means you can't literally help out for the rest of the time. So you become oh, inactive yeah. and that's we can't have that. You've got to be as active as possible. So... You don't really have time to think about how you feel, but I know it has a tremendous emotional effect on you in the end because after years of doing this now, every time I hear a sound, I jump. If I hear a loud sound uh, of any sort, I jump. I'm on alert all the time because that's yeah. how you have to be when you're out near the reserves. You've got to be on alert. 
and I'm just on alert the whole time. Even now I'm on alert when I'm mm. sitting in front of the TV, I'm on alert when I'm at work, I'm on alert. And so mm. basically you never relax. You never go out, come back, and then or if the once the kill is finished, you don't say, oh, well, that's it for the year. You're on alert the whole time, which is very, uh, it, it has a lot of wear and tear on you emotionally and physically. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you so much, Carolyn. It's been amazing to hear your voice. And just to sort of, we're just getting a little bit of the introduction into Canberra tonight. This is what's happening for people in Canberra. In fact, we put the, uh, hosted this now at the end of April because we're expecting it to start in May in, in June in the next few months. And we just are wanting people to really know what's happening. This is happening in Canberra year after year. So thank you so much for your work. And now I'd really like to introduce our next speaker who's going to talk to us a little bit about the implications of why they keep doing this to cat to uh, kangaroos. Um, I'm just going to do the, do this. And Carolyn there. So I'd like very much now to welcome uh, Frankie Seymour. She's been an activist for much of her life and spent the last decade focusing on kangaroos. Frankie's an environmental scientist and co-founder of the Animal Protectors Alliance. Uh, she served on the Sea Shepherd in 1981, 1982, and published a book, All Hearts on Deck, about those campaigns. She's, also, she's been doing this for a long time. From 1986 to 2012, she was president and or committee member of the Animal Liberation Act, uh, Animal Liberation and the ACT, and is now a life member. Thanks for your great work, Frankie. She's also served for many years on the Animals Ex Australia Executive Committee and the Animal Welfare Advisory Committee to the ACT government. In 2016, Frankie stood for the Animal Justice Party federal election and ran again in the 2019 New South Wales election. So welcome, Frankie, and thanks so much for talking to us tonight. Well, thanks for hosting it. Um, from a, a purely scientific, I'm, I'm only going to, I'm just going to read from notes because you know, if I talk, I'll just go off on tangents. So I'm just going to read. I hope you can cope. And I don't have slides because I'm not high tech. Um, from a purely scientific point of view, the ACT government's alleged reasons for killing uh, kangaroos in the ACT are nonsense. In the first place, the ACT government's annual massacre began in a complete vacuum of any baseline data on how many kangaroos under what environmental conditions are needed on the reserves to maintain the keystone function of kangaroo grazing. Since then, there have been uh, two ACT kangaroo management plans. The first of these in 2010 recommended monitoring of the impacts of the killing and adaptive management based on the data derived from this monitoring. To date, there has been no monitoring of the impacts and certainly no adaptive management. In fact, the second kangaroo management plan of 2017 does not even mention adaptive management anymore. Nowadays, kangaroo populations in the ACT are estimated by a desktop calculator program which is devoid of baseline data, employs erroneous parameters and requires absolutely nothing resembling ground truthing. The two kangaroo management plans also fail to provide any plausible scientific evidence that kangaroos on ACT reserves have ever had any deleterious impacts on any other plant or animal species. There has never been any scientific basis for the kangaroo management plan's assertion that current knowledge, their words, uh, uh, indicates that one kangaroo per hectare is a desirable density. That's the assertion of the kangaroo management plan, that current knowledge uh, indicates one per hectare is good. In fact, at ACAT, that's our local uh, um, admin tribunal, uh, at ACAT 2013, the government spokesman admitted that this figure was wrong and a guess explaining it, uh, explaining that it was just a starting point for working out the correct figure. Since then, there has been no research whatsoever to support the use of this wrong guess. There has also never been any scientific basis uh, for the uh, uh, Parks and Conservation's repeated assertion, assertions in press releases 
that any threatened species is in any way threatened by kangaroo grazing. Again, at ACAT 2013, the government spokesperson was confronted with the fact that no threat abatement plan or recovery plan for any of the threatened species identified in the press releases mentions kangaroo grazing as a threat. At this point, the government spokesperson admitted that this list of species was just PR. Again, at ACAT 2013, the government spokesperson admitted that the ACT government's only indicator for biodiversity was volume of grass. The entire basis for his assumption that kangaroo grazing has a deleterious impact on the reserve ecosystems was because kangaroos eat grass. In my view, any competent ecologist or other environmental scientist understands that it is diversity of vegetation, not quantity of grass, which is the indicator for broader biodiversity. Kangaroos, by every aspect of their physiology and behaviour, maintain diversity of vegetation. Numerous plant species, some high grass, some medium grass, some low grass, some bare soil. Another admission by the government spokesperson at ACAT 2013, and perhaps the most telling of all, was that the kangaroo management plan's recommendation to kill 30 to 40 percent of kangaroos every year was in fact killing kangaroos four times faster than it is possible for kangaroos to reproduce themselves. To explain this, he admitted, and this incidentally was contrary to the evidence he had given at ACAT under the same president in 2009, that this level of killing was needed not because of reproduction, given that this population replenishment was impossible by reproduction, but because populations were being replenished by inward migration. The shocking thing about this admission is that if inward migration is always going to replace the kangaroos killed, then the killing is clearly achieving absolutely nothing. Even more chilling is the fact that this inward migration can only continue as long as there are kangaroos outside the reserves available to move in. Given that all the kangaroo habitat, kangaroo habitat in the ACT, which is outside the reserves, is being systematically devoured by developments of various sorts, this inward migration simply cannot continue much longer. Recruitment from outside the ACT is also likely to dry up very soon because of the um, uh, unregulated slaughter now underway on rural lands in surrounding New South Wales, where the entire population of eastern grey kangaroos has been estimated on the basis of lost habitat to have been reduced to only 11% of the population at the time of European settlement. What is in fact happening is that the ACT reserves are being used as sinks to draw in all the ACT surviving kangaroos to one place where they can be easily exterminated, a neat and permanent final solution. The Kangaroo Management Plan of 2017 finally got around to at least attempting to proffer some evidence that kangaroo grazing is damaging to other species inhabiting the reserves. It refers to eight papers, although there are actually only seven since one of them doesn't even mention kangaroos. These seven papers are in fact by only five primary authors, since one of the authors is responsible for three of them. This particular author is in fact a former employee of ACT, CT, ACT Parks and Conservation, and on two of these papers, one of his co-authors is the ACT government chief ecologist. Most of these seven papers have co-authors and most have at least one or two or three shared co-authors. Between them, all these authors and co-authors represent an extremely narrow field of research. Without prejudice to the competence or integrity of these authors, they represent a field of research that is substantially funded by the ACT government and most of them are uh, most of the primary authors acknowledge that they are in some way beholden to the ACT government. Most of them are also connected in some way with the ANU Fenner School, 
where, as far as I can make out, their primary function is to do research on behalf of the uh, pest animal industry, the pest animal management industry. Finally, none of the papers even claims to provide unequivocal evidence that kangaroo grazing is impacting on other native species. At worst, they merely confirm the keystone role of kangaroos in managing other plant and animal species uh, as they have done for five to five million years. Uh, Frankie, I'm just giving you a one minute um, call out there for okay. your yes. talk. Um, what is even more telling is that, uh, that that what is even more telling than the eight papers is the one paper funded by the eight papers. It's not even referenced in the Kangaroo Management Plan of 2017. We would not even know we had paid for this study and it had not been released under Freedom of Information in 2017, presumably because the poor junior clerk who released it had no reason to, to suppose that he, he should have redacted it. Um, the report by Syro Plant Industries showed that at least one kangaroo per hectare in ACT reserves was better for vegetation richness and diversity than none, that there was no difference in impact either positive or negative between one and three kangaroos per hectare, and that larger densities than three per hectare did not occur on any of the reserves studied. In conclusion, every premise that is currently being used to justify the, uh, to justify the ACT government's annual kangaroo, kangaroo massacre on ACT reserves is either dead wrong or seriously flawed. That's me. Thank you so much, Frankie. That's fantastic. Uh, I'll just put me back up again. So um, I'm just looking at some questions. Um, can you have a look? I'm just... Uh, I can't quite see the questions here tonight, so I'm just going to ask you some. Frankie, what do you think is the... How do you think this is going to change? Does someone need to... Who's going to make, who's going to make change? I know you've been working on it for a long time. Do you see any window for change here? Um, I'm very close to total despair. I think the, uh, my, my gut feeling is that we're not going to save the kangaroos of the ACT or, or indeed anywhere else. But if there is hope, I think it's got to come from overseas and it's got to come through the tourist industry. Right, yeah. The tour Tell us a bit more about the tourist industry. ACT, well, as Carol described, and that, well, no, I think it was as you described, it is, it, it, the ACT is the bush capital. It could be such an attractive place for people to come. We are killing the the, the goose that laid the golden egg, if, you can, if I can use that. We could have, because we have this system of reserves that runs from the north to the south to the east to the west, all through the ACT, but they're all divided at the moment by these massive highways and big roads. If we had overpasses like they have in some other countries, vegetated overpasses that both people and wildlife could um, move from reserve to re reserve, imagine what a draw card that would be for the ACT as a tourist destination. There, um, there, there is nothing um, remotely attractive to people from outside uh, Australia about coming to a, uh, uh, a national capital where the national emblem is being massacred at a rate of thousands a year, but there would be so much, it would be so attractive to have, to well, to return to the bush capital status and to add these um, overpass corridors for wildlife. Yeah, right. And I mean, that, I know that Australia has worked quite hard with against or against the whaling in Japan for the very same reasons. Um, do we, I mean, do people want to travel to Japan to see whales when they know that they're whaling? Do people want to travel to Canberra when they know the cam you know the kangaroos are being culled every year. I mean I know that there's so much potential in a as the capital city with the government to have this kind of coexistence happening in the Canberra city. And it just seems I mean that's kind of always yeah so counterintuitive that that you would kill kangaroos in Canberra when, you know, really everyone wants to see kangaroos that comes to Australia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting, the science, it doesn't feel like uh, you're allowed to have another opinion in Canberra that goes against the science. Would that be your um, vision of that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's been so much persecution of uh, scientists who've dared to step out of the line. Maria can probably tell you more that about, because she's got a whole chapter on that in um, her, her book. Uh, 
so perhaps that's a question to talk to ask your ear okay. about. But you know, I've seen I've had a friend who's had to change universities. Um, there's a story of uh, um, Robin Tennant Wood, which t Maria tells in her book. Uh, and then there's the scientists who've given evidence. Eminent scientists like um, uh, Dan Ramp, who've been basically treated like shit by the ACT. Excuse my language. By the ACT government and treated and and in, and and. They've taken the evidence of someone who really hasn't got anything like Dan's uh, understanding and knowledge um, over uh, that uh, that over Dan Ramp, Dr. Ramp's um, uh, knowledge, and on apparently no basis whatsoever. I mean, you heard what happened at the ACATS. <laughs> I, I yeah. told you what happened. Yeah. 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 All these, all these revelations that proved that everything the government was saying was crap, and uh, and yet they fought real in favour of the government. Okay. Someone hey, thank you so someone, much, Frankie. That's someone fantastic. Watch, someone watching from Germany. Hey, uh, there's people tonight watching from Germany and the UK, and we're so and all around Australia. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Frankie, for letting us know that and. Look, it's my great pleasure now to introduce you to uh, Tara Ward. Um, I'll just say goodbye to Frankie and put Tara up. Uh, Tara is the founder and principal lawyer of the Animal Defenders Office, a national community legal centre dealing with legal matters affecting animals and their defenders. In 2017, the Animal Defenders Office was accredited by the National Association of Community Legal Centres, which is the peak industry body for community legal centres in Australia. Tara is a member of the Statutory Animal Welfare Advisory Committee advising the ACT Minister, responsible for animal welfare and an animal welfare category member on a University Animal Ethics Committee. So look, we're really interested to hear what you have to say, Tara. We know you've been working on it also for a long time and um, we look forward to hearing what you have to tell us about how it's been going. I'll just Thank add you your, much, uh, I'll just add your, um, talk to the screen. There you go. Thank you very much uh, for hosting this event and for inviting me to speak on it and to um, give the um, animal lawyers perspective. So yes, for the next 10 minutes or so, we'll be looking at the legal side of things. But before we get to the law, let's start with a quote from Peter Singer, the renowned Australian philosopher. In 2005, he observed that we need a Mabo decision for Australia's wild animals, a legal recognition of their special status as original residents of Australia, alongside its original inhabitants. So over the, over the next 10 minutes, as we look at the legal framework regulating human interaction with kangaroos, and particularly here in the ACT, <clears throat> let's be thinking about this quote. In other words, why do we need or do we need a Mabo style decision for wildlife? What's wrong with the current legal framework protecting wildlife that may have prompted Peter Singer to make this observation? So tonight, we'll look at changes to wildlife laws in the ACT that threaten not only the animals themselves, but some of our fundamental democratic rights as well. So let's just start with a few uh, legal fundamentals. So in law, <clears throat> as we all probably know all too well now, animals are regarded as property. They're not legal persons, which means they have no legal rights at all. And if we think of domestic animals, for example, let's just take our sort of the family pet, all the usual indicators of property are there. We possess them, we control them, we know how many we've got, hopefully. <clears throat> but what about wildlife? Does the law regard wild animals as property as well? And if so, of whom? The High Court of Australia, no less, has looked at this issue. In 1999, a case involving the Queensland government went all the way to the High Court. And this was the case of Yanna and Eaton. It was a case about traditional Indigenous hunting rights. The Queensland government tried to assert in legislation that fauna, so wild animals, was the property of the state. This attempted claim to ownership of wildlife was dismissed by the High Court of Australia. It said no one can own free living wildlife because you can't identify what exactly would be owned by anyone who claimed to be the owner, such as the government. Also, the government doesn't possess the free living wildlife. The whole point of property is that you possess it. 
the whole point of wildlife, is that it is beyond human possession. So the court concluded that the property status of free living wildlife is something less than full property ownership. The court also considered whether governments have any claims over wildlife. The High Court of Australia said, yes, governments have the power to regulate its exploitation. So that's why we have governments making decisions about who can kill wildlife and how many wild animals can be killed and so on. And that's why for a long time in the ACT and elsewhere, we've had licensing regimes. In other words, regimes forbidding the taking or keeping of wildlife, except under a license granted by the state or the, or the relevant government. <clears throat> and that's why administrative law is such an important area of law when it comes to defending wild animals. It's the area of law that allows the ordinary citizen to challenge government decisions that affect us. Its whole rationale is to keep governments accountable and to make government decision making transparent. That's why taking legal action to protect free living animals often happens by way of challenging government decisions to grant licenses uh, to kill them. In the ACT, for example, as Frankie has already um, mentioned, we've had three administrative law challenges of the ACT government's kangaroo kills that take place in these nature reserves, in other words, public land, on alleged conservation grounds. The kangaroos are killed by private kangaroo shooters whom the government hires and on behalf of whom one part of the government applies for a license to kill and another part of the government makes a decision to grant those licenses. The culls are announced very suddenly with very little warning. So in all three challenges of the decisions to grant the licenses, an injunction was sought to stop the shooting that was about to take place or in some cases had already started. Each time the government tried to dismiss the legal challenges as frivolous stunts by activists. Yet all three were successful at the interim stage. In other words, all three successfully obtained an injunction, meaning they satisfied the threshold legal test that the material before the tribunal indicates that there is a serious issue to be tried on the substantive application. All three applications did go on to substantive hearings, and even though they were ultimately unsuccessful in stopping the entire coal, they tested the law and made some important legal gains. For example, the first challenge established not only that an animal rights group could be and was affected by the decision to kill kangaroos in the AT, so in other words, not an individual directly affected by the decision, say a resident who might live nearby or near to a nature reserve and claim that the shooting at night, late at night, um, is, a, is a nuisance. <clears throat> so we're talking about a group here, but also a group that didn't even have to be from the ACT. So in that case, Animal Liberation New South Wales established that it had interests affected by a decision by the ACT government to allow kangaroos in the ACT to be killed. So this was a breakthrough in the law of standing. The next case made significant gains as well, as Frankie has already mentioned. The tribunal actually agreed the government had got its calculations wrong about population densities and ordered the government to redo its numbers, which resulted in fewer kangaroos being killed. And then in the next case, for the first time, the applicants, a local group, Animal Liberation ACT, and represented by the Animal Defenders Office, asked the tribunal to accept that animal welfare was a relevant consideration in deciding whether to kill kangaroos on public land. Extraordinarily, this was the first time the tribunal had been asked to consider this. The three members actually had to adjourn the hearing to deliberate, but eventually held that yes, animal welfare was a relevant consideration in the decision to grant a license to kill kangaroos. Also, the case resulted in the important finding about the unconscionable impact of the culls on at-foot joeys. Our barrister got one of the government's chief witnesses, a vet who had overseen a recent cull, to admit that hundreds of at-foot joeys would have died a slow, painful death from starvation, dehydration or predation as a direct result of the cull. And their deaths are not counted in official cull numbers because they die alone and after their mothers are shot. Our barrister coined the poignant phrase of this being a ghost population of at-foot joeys. It was amazing how he got the vet to admit that in cross-examination and how he proved it to the tribunal, but that will have to wait for another time. The main thing is to this day, the ACT government hates this idea of a ghost population of joeys killed, a result, killed as a result of its culls and tries to this day to debunk it unsuccessfully. Anyway, Remember that these challenges were possible because the government regulated human interaction with wildlife through licensing regimes. 
and the decision to grant a license was a reviewable decision. In other words, the decision to grant the license was specifically referenced in the relevant act, as was who could apply for review, being an entity whose interests are affected by the license. But the government did not like its decisions being challenged or being held to account. So what did the government do? Make better decisions? Maybe hold a moratorium while it evaluated the culls and the putative science that allegedly supported them to assess whether the culls were based on sound science and were achieving their alleged conservation aims and reassure the community of this. No. Instead, it looked for ways to stop groups from challenging its decisions. How did it do this? Uh, one of the ways it considered was rather than uh, apply for a license every year, let's apply for a license every five years. So there's only one decision every five years that can be challenged. But then it came up with an even better plan. And that was, let's get rid of the whole old act and uh, under which licenses could be applied and bring in a new one that contained a mechanism that would be a much better way of stopping challenges to its decisions to kill kangaroos. In short, and that's exactly what they did, and this new act allows a single minister to change fundamentally the kangaroo's legal status and basically declare them to be a pest or, in nicer language, controlled native species. And sure enough, one night in 2017, by a stroke of his pen, the environment minister of the day used this provision and in a single page he declared that the eastern grey kangaroo is now a controlled native species in the ACT. One thing to, is, uh, to note is that it does only apply to eastern grey kangaroos and not other species of macro, pro, macropods. But why did the minister do this? What was the official reason? The explanatory statement for the declaration says the minister is satisfied that the species, eastern grey kangaroos, is having an unacceptable environmental and economic impact in the ACT. Now remember, of course, that we are talking about a local native wild animal who has been in the area for millions of years. And the next question is, what are the consequences of a native species legal status being changed in this way? The first thing is that once a species has been declared a controlled native species, a draft management plan must be prepared before any control action can be taken about the species. And once the plan has been finalised, it must must be implemented. That is a legal obligation. And for eastern grey kangaroos, what does implementation mean? Of course, it means they can start to be killed. But how does this killing happen under this new act, this new regime? Are licenses still required with reviewable government decisions? In short, no. Under the new act, the relevant government authority can simply authorise another person to take action to implement the plan. And this has a whole heap of consequences. There is no reviewable decision, so that means all the old benefits of reviewable decisions, including an obligation on government to notify those affected by the decisions, and then those entities being able to get a statement of reasons for the decision and then seek merits review are now all gone. And this is why critics of the process spoke out loudly against what the government did. For example, Animal Liberation ACT put out an, uh, a media release, as did the Animal Defenders Office, which talked about the assault on the fundamental principle of accountable and open government decision making. And of course, while it's eastern grey kangaroos today, it might be magpies tomorrow or flying foxes or wombats or currawongs uh, or any of those species that the government of the day doesn't like who are dealt with in the same way. And it will be so much harder for citizens to stop this happening or to do anything to challenge what one or two bureaucrats or politicians decide behind closed doors about how these species should be treated. So as uh, in, uh, as we, as I um, near con concluding, let's just look at uh, whether there are any ways of challenging these kills if merits review of a decision to grant a, dis a license to kill is no longer possible. Well, the Animal Defenders Office tried one way. If we quickly look back at the law, the Minister's declaration is actually a disallowable instrument. So is the Controlled Native Species Management Plan. Now, this means very quickly that a member of the Legislative Assembly, which is our parliament here in the ACT, can move a notice of motion to disallow the instrument within a certain number of sitting days, which can be um, end up being quite a long period of time. So the Animal Defender's Office decided, who can we visit? It's no point in visiting the major, uh, in trying to lobby the major parties as they both support the cull. So we thought we would uh, lobby the ACT uh, Greens 
to see if they would consider moving a motion to disallow the plan, uh, the Controlled Native Species Plan. We pointed out that such an anti-democratic measure, uh, changing the kangaroo's legal status, <clears throat> Uh, conflicts with the ACT Greens' commitment to grassroots de participatory democracy as stated in their constitution. But unfortunately, they agreed with the plan, so refused to move a motion of disallowance. Tara, uh, you have to, Tara can I interrupt? Sorry, we're just coming to an end now uh, because of the timing, if that's okay. Yes, just drawing to a conclusion now. So just quickly, um, a freedom of information um, applications could be used or um, even uh, judicial review uh, in the Supreme Court, but there are um, significant barriers to seeking justice in that way. So by way of conclusion, let's go back to our starting point. Peter Singer's quote about needing a Marbo style decision for our wildlife. And we talked about why he would have said that. In other words, what's wrong with the current legal framework protecting the wildlife? Well, as we've seen over the last 10 or more uh, minutes, perhaps a better question is, uh, what's right with it, um, uh, what's right with the um, uh, current legal framework when uh, it certainly allows wildlife to be uh, destroyed uh, rather than protected. Yeah, thank you so much. I know you've been working on this for a long time. There's a note to get in touch with Tara, the Animal Defenders Office, uh, anyone's welcome to. Thank you so much, Tara, for that. Uh, you just went a bit over, so we won't have questions for you tonight, but I'm sure if you look down the uh, comments, Tara, you could just um, answer them back on the comments if you wouldn't mind. But thank you so much for talking with us. And uh, now our last speaker I'd really love to introduce uh, you to is I'm just going to get rid of these things and put these guys up. Uh, Tara, thank you so much, Tara. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to uh, Maria Taylor, who's our fourth speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Maria Taylor, she lives and works in New South Wales, just outside of Canberra. And Maria is an author and has a PhD in the communication of science. Her new book, Injustice, has just been published. I'm just going to show you a copy, a uh, picture of that, which you guys will want to um, get. And it has a lot of the, um, where is, why isn't that coming out? Share the screen. Yeah. I'll just share that with you all. There you go. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, Marie's new book, Injustice, has just been published exposing the colonial cultural history that has driven the dispossession and disrespect for our Indigenous native wildlife. Over the past 10 years, Maria has observed and reported on the national shame that is the ACT government annual cull of the Eastern Grey. She says the real reason that the ACT's once pilot project has cemented it to an annual million dollar taxpayer funded slaughter of Australia's national emblem in the nation's capital remains anyone's guess. So uh, let's welcome uh, Maria and she is going to then go and welcome Christine. So thanks Maria and I'll leave it over to you. Thank you Kate and uh, thank you everyone um, for being here tonight. So I've been asked to talk about the role of media in the ACT cull and also what I've learned from some residents, how, they, how they're affected. On, on that count, I thought it best to hear directly from a Canberra resident and invited Christine Stevens, who's here with us tonight, um, to, join, to join my time, time here. Christine's from Isaacs Ridge and she, she will tell her story of encountering the cull. But before handing over, I'll share a few notes about what all of us experience in communications about this lethal so-called management program. So what we're really talking about is a, is a national, long-standing, dominant narrative on how to think about kangaroos. And that is sold to the public in lockstep by economic forces working with governments, along with part of the applied ecology community, and is amplified uncritically by the media. You can hear this narrative any day of the week, and it is on the upswing at the moment with the move in the United States Congress to ban the import of Australian kangaroo skin and meat. The EU is also being asked to consider bans. Now, this is portrayed by Australian officials and mainstream media um, as an assault on a must-have export industry. This is key. This is the way we think. 
that kangaroos are basically another um, export uh, item, a product uh, similar to coal or iron ore, we have kangaroos. So the word treasonous has been used in that regard. So I wrote my book to counter that narrative with history and some facts of how we got to this situation with our wildlife in this country. And the remaining large kangaroos, as we know, are now Australia's most persecuted indigenous animal. And there's an unchanging storyline that's, that's attached to them to justify the bloodshed. So it's not just the ACT, it's Australia wide. And this is just despite the fact that the world loves Skippy, the bush kangaroo, and he or she, Skippy, uh, draws tourists by the busload. And, in, and this, as we all know, this unique marsupial holds up one half of our national coat of arms, along with the equally unique em emu, which has also been a, a victim of mass persecution since settlement. The question tonight relates to how we became a culture of silence and conformity that treats the kangaroo as either a pest or a product, a treatment that has morphed in the past 70 years into the world's biggest online wildlife slaughter for kids skin and meat, um, or just for removal from, from agricultural land. And by the way, the much beloved koala that now is on the brink of regional extinctions, suffered a similar savage slaughter up to the mid-1920s and has never really recovered its populations. So the ACT may claim that its killing is somehow better because it is non-commercial, but the colour is very much part of that post-colonial value structure. And what are those values? Well, they're really characterised by disrespect, for starters, and disinterest in understanding the contribution of native grazers in balanced ecosystems. And on top of that, there's a flat out demonization of any native animal that bothers agricultural businesses or sometimes other commerce. So that starts with grazing kangaroos and wallabies, but also targets emus, wombats, dingoes, eagles, other birds, and um, bats. Uh, I mean, we all know uh, who, who's targeted in our country. So culturally, there's a direct link of thinking from colonial times. So if you could put up that Narendra slide, Kate, that uh, kind of gives us a sense of what was happening in the interim. Um, so this thinking has become so embedded in the dominant narrative that any claims about too many and that our export nation and farmers need kangaroos to be killed, just gets an automatic nod from most media reporters and also from most Australians to who don't give it much thought. The Canberra cull is related in cultural understanding and dog whistles pest and too many. Canberra media has never asked the three major parties in the city, in the ACT, to justify a million dollar cost of attack taxpayers for this cull or, or, the, or the related animal cruelty or to explain who benefits even. Anyway, the Canberra advising ecologists, as we've heard from Tara and from Frankie, have pivoted to another compelling narrative that deflects inquiries. The story now is that all of biodiversity, which suddenly does not include kangaroos, benefits from the annual slaughter. Females and pouch joeys and dependent young can be killed more freely under this framework. And Canberra Media has not questioned why the government is now bringing in ex-military types to hunt down the survivors in the suburbs and on the reserves. This culture of disrespect and killing is across Australia. And the commercial, and this is another factor that plays in in the ACT definitely, the commercial kangaroo industry has a very active PR operation and often relies on supporting, on supporting voices that say, trust us, we're scientists. And the ACT narrative has relied on similar claims of scientific insight. So a lockstep narrative demonizing another group is usually called propaganda. We all must think alike about kangaroos as things to disrespect and rightfully to be shot and stuffed into petrol cans or thrown into pits 
as you've seen in the ACT. And all of this means that if you do a content analysis of Australian media reports, you find there are seldom or never any balancing voices that question kangaroo narratives or that shine a light on the cruelties of the kangaroo harvesting, so-called, the euphemism for the world-beating slaughter for pet food and skins. So what's missing? Well, what's missing is any reporting about the benefits of coexistence and what that might look like. Missing is research on kangaroo roles in their ecosystem. What, what do they contribute to healthy grassy woodlands? They co-evolved co with those habitats. And what could kangaroos and other wildlife contribute to Australia, to Canberra and to farm economies through ecotourism and coexistence? All told, we need a new respect, understanding and sharing with our common wildlife. And that by common wildlife I mean those that are not already endangered before it's too late as the world rapidly loses biodiversity. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Christine. Um, I'd like to express my hope though before I do that, <laughs> that the ACT government does not again spoil Mother's Day by announcing its awful cull is starting about then. So this, this image was uh, at my house, at, my, at our property. Um, so introducing Christine. I met Christine Stevens around June 2016 and Christine had a heartbreaking story to tell me, which I reported for our online publication, The District Bulletin, of what happened to what she called her long-term friends, the kangaroos on Isaacs Ridge. And the whole suburb was affected and her stories in the book too. So thanks for joining me, Christine. And can you tell us what happened on that June long weekend and your observations on the, on the ridge before and after the kangaroos were shot? Ah, uh, we don't have Christine. Sorry, here I am. There you are, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> if I might just set the scene. Uh, our suburb is 30 years old. Um, we were some of the first residents here and we have walked the ridge um, for the entirety of that time. We, like Maria, had our garden visitors. Um, the roos would come down from the ridge. Um, they'd mow our grass, they'd fertilise our grass. They were the perfect uh, host. They were like lawnmowers and that they kept it to just the perfect level. They never went too deep. They never disturbed the grass. They never left footprints. They're very soft. Uh, they're very gentle um, and they were very friendly. We have them passing through. You'd see their footprints on the frosty morning, but no more, sadly. Um, we had four main species on Isaac's Ridge. So as you walked up through the forest, up to the pasture, the open lands near the top, you saw originally the swamp wallabies, uh, very shy creatures. Then you moved up and you saw the euros, which were beautiful gentle kangaroos in the middle. Uh, then near the top, we had the red-necked wallabies and at the very top, we had the eastern greys. And they would let us move through and amongst them, you could walk. They didn't bother, they weren't concerned, they were never aggressive. It was just a beautiful environment. And we had many international visitors, very many people from the embassies would come down. I've seen walking groups, tour groups, childcare groups, um, all visiting the ridge. Um, now things have changed. It was in back at that time in 2016 when suddenly the reserves were closed. Uh, we would be penalised up to $7,500 if we went onto the reserve after 5 p.m. at night or before 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, the danger was firearms, and firearms are very close to the residences um, uh, at this property. Uh, at the very top, they're less than a kilometre, and I have seen tracks that have been right next to the houses, uh, tracks from the vehicles of the shooters. So they put up this sign. Uh, it was a cull that was, the reserve was closed for two and a half months um, and that was extended to three months the subsequent years, although they didn't use all that time to shoot and they would release it a little bit early. But basically we couldn't walk our dogs um, at the usual time uh, before and after work. Um, 
But the tragedy was that we knew our friends up in the ridge were in danger. We just didn't realise how much that danger would be. So it was in the June long weekend, um, a Saturday night I went up. Uh, I was sure to make sure I was out by five and I was wandering along the ridge and this was the beautiful family group, very healthy, robust kangaroos with little young sitting in the last rays of the sun on a winter's evening uh, as it went down. They were just quietly there uh, preparing for the night. I went on 200 metres and the shooters were there just over the crest of the knoll. Um, the shooters were preparing themselves. They had their tip truck, they had their digger, they had uh, their four-wheel drive ATV, they had two park ranger trucks and these steely men were there. They were closing the gate. A bearded fellow pointed, saw me, pointed to the watch and said, you know, you've got to get out of here now. So I headed out. I was too terrified to even approach them. I was too terrified to go back and try and chase the kangaroos away. Um, I was exiting and one of the park ranger trucks kept following me. It was five paces behind me. It wouldn't let up. It had its lights on, although it wasn't dark, as you can see. Um, and it was incredibly intimidating. As I went down, there were people coming up into the forest because those signs weren't adequate. They were put up three days before the cull started. People enter onto that reserve without actually knowing it was there. It wasn't advertised in the press. It... it um, Letters were meant to have been sent through to the suburb, but I never received one and no one else that I know of has either. But the residents were distressed because night after night they would hear the shooting, they would hear the guns. They knew that these beautiful creatures were being shot and indeed they were. And now we have no kangaroos left. I've seen one swamp wallaby and five kangaroos on a 387 hectare property, which can hold up to 387 kangaroos even on their own figures. And the culling would suggest that you're removing um, according to specified criteria. There was none of this. You can see the blood that was left on the ground, just on the path where we walk with children. Um, it was incredibly distressing. So there, there could be up to 387 kangaroos under their own, their own figures, but I have seen five over a 12 month period and one small probably. So it is incredibly distressing. We don't have them in our gardens anymore. They're not passing through the suburbs. They're not sitting outside the embassies as they used to do. They were always around the embassy properties. So it's been immensely distressing. And if, ah, and if you look at the beautifully mown grass, that's the grass before they started the cull. The kangaroos kept it immaculate. They never went too far. They always made sure there was enough to eat on. The other picture with the thistles is the very same property after five years of culling. The kangaroos are no longer there and now it's overgrown with thistles. The concern for the property, the reason for the cull was to preserve the native species. The native species are 40, 30 metre trees, 15 metre trees. The yellow box is strictly bark, stringy bark gum. So um, they're not a problem for the kangaroo. So what has happened is that the species the small flowers that they're also trying to protect that are threatened by thistles. They're threatened by the destruction of the natural habitat. The destruction of the natural habitat has happened there because it is a pine plantation, as you can see, and the other part that isn't a pine plantation has been horse adjustment paddocks. So there is nothing on the Isaacs Nature Ridge which has not been affected by um, human habitation, by a change of use, um, destroying the original habitation. So the arguments are spurious as to reason for the cull. The kangaroos actually are self-limiting and don't overpropagate, so they will never starve. Um, so yes, excuse my distress, but it has no, been a very sad event. Thank you so much for that, Christine. It's, a, it's devastating to hear just what it's like for people living near the kangaroos. We know it's devastating, we know it's violent, and we know it's worse for the kangaroos, of course. So, you know, to have that close relationship, which all Australians would be so lucky to have, uh, it's really devastating to hear what it's been like in your backyard. And thanks to Maria and Christine for sharing that. Um, look, I'm sorry we've kept you all um, online for a bit longer. We've just got a few more bits of updates to let you know. Um, thank you so much to everyone tonight. We really appreciate you coming on. We really appreciate uh, that we can have such a fantastic panel 
Um, I'm just going to share a screen for the last bit of the evening just to tell you some updates and how you can actually help um, with tonight's, with uh, all the things from tonight. So I'll just do that. Get us under there. Right. So I just um, you, you for chatting. There you go. So how can you help? I know uh, lots of people have been asking how they can help, and we want to let you know what you can do. Um, it's happening in Australia. It's happening all over Australia. It's happening every night, and it's happening in Canberra soon. Um, no matter how they're being killed, for many different reasons, kangaroos are being killed across Australia. If you're in Canberra, you can become an on-the-ground activist if you want at the reserves watching and witnessing and protesting. Um, and you can also donate lightweight spotlights, especially headlamps, lightweight video cameras. Um, talk to these people. You can info them, and there's the um, information. I'll put that up um, on the chat line as well later, so you can, if you want to come back for these details, they will be there. Um, if you don't live in Canberra, you can email these people and just let them know that you're you want this to end. You're not interested in these kills on public lands in Canberra. Um, I'll, uh, these people, I'll let you know their, all their information. Uh, you can write to them directly and talk to them about what your point of view is on the purpose and sadness of killing these kangaroos in Canberra. Um, there's an example email if you want to, um, as a uh, concerned citizen of wherever you're from, I urge the ACT government to end the unethical killing of kangaroos on public land in the ACT region. If you'd like a, a sample or a more comprehensive email, Animal Liberation ACT will help you if you want to email them directly. Um, if you want to donate to people who are working on the ground, it'd be fantastic if you could reach out to these two groups, the Animal Liberation and the ACT, who are assisting with the costs of equipment and all the actions they do to try and stop this. These people have been doing this a long, long time, so any assistance you can give would be fantastic. And the group uh, Australian Wildlife Protection Council with Maria Taylor to support all that's going on with the ACT kangaroos um, and they're advocating for coexistence right across the country. Um, to find out more about uh, uh, Marie's, Maria's book, Injustice, you can go to her website. And um, Frankie Seymour talked a lot from her paper, Bounding Extinction, and I'll put that up on the chat now so you can get that to read. It's a fantastic uh, piece she wrote about all her work over the years. So it'd be really useful for you to know that. Um, so the exciting thing with Kangaroos Alive is that we are holding um, regular webinars. Our next webinar is going to be on the 7th, uh, on the, sorry, the 26th of May at 7 p.m. Uh, if you're on our Facebook group, uh, we will keep you um, informed about that. The next webinar is Becoming a Kangaroo Advocate in Your Community. We're going to have some fantastic speakers of that, about that and lots of different ways that people across Australia are really working with their community or on their properties to really help kangaroos. So thank you so much to everyone, especially our speakers tonight for coming on board. We really appreciate, uh, sorry, just getting this sorted. We really appreciate you being with us here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for coming across and thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I know that the speakers can have a look down to and see, answer some of your questions. There's so much we can do in Australia. All our voices are important and I really want people to feel empowered and um, activated to make a difference. All our voices matter. And, you know, you can tell from Tara's talk that, you know, there was change, there was response to those court cases. They weren't, they didn't just, you know, not everything goes the government's way, not everything goes the industry's way, not everything is wrong if we can speak up about it. So um, thank you so much. We'll end here. And if you have any questions, you can keep chatting on um, uh, this line. And um, thank you once again to all our fabulous speakers from Canberra, not just for speaking tonight, but for really your endless years and time and energy and concern for kangaroos in your area. We appreciate all that you do and thank you.
So thanks very much, everyone. Good night.